Welcome to my talk, Demystifying Git, Virgin Control from First Principles. I'll give you just a second to find that tiny URL, dcashville-git, uh, dash and that is where the slides are for this. Um, I didn't think to put them like in the bottom corner, but feel free to grab them from there. Um, and of course I'll share this afterward, and this recording will be available thanks to Kevin Thal, who just walked in. Um, so I'm Dwayne. I I'm very happy to be back in person at a Drupal camp three years later, and I'm so happy to be here with y'all. Uh, but these days I live in Chicago. Um, I'm a developer evangelist, come to Git Crack, and more about them in a second. Uh, love improv, uh, where I do that a lot in, in Chicago. I love live music, go to a lot of rock and roll these days. Thankfully, it's all back, it's good. Um, knit crochet still sometimes and karaoke as much as I can. So I mentioned I work for Get Kraken. We are a company that makes uh, some things. Uh, if you haven't gotten stickers yet, I'm gonna throw these to you. And they're in packs of three, so if they flip over when you're handing them out, when you run to one that's facing the other direction, you've gotten all the stickers from that pack. So pack up right around. Um, so Get Kraken Client is a desktop app to manage Git on your desktop. Uh, it's a GUI, but it's also got a CLI built in. Um, so everybody should be able to use it. Um, Git Lens, if you're using VS Code, no reason not to use this. It's free, it's open source, it's amazing. Uh, line by line, Git blame and annotation for everything. Much easier way to use Git with VS Code. And Git integration for Jira is just what it sounds like. If you use Jira, you probably won't use that. Um, before we go any further, one of my favorite sales books ever read in my whole life, Can't Teach a Kid to Write a Bike at a Seminar. <laughs> I can't teach a Git, I can't teach you all the concepts of Git. What I can teach you is some concept overviews and then you can go and figure the stuff out on your own. And I'll point you in the right direction. But that's, the question and answer of this is gonna be very short and most of the time it's gonna be like, yeah, I can point you to this other resource. So why am I talking about Git? Because we all use Git. Even if you don't use Git on the daily, you probably use Git enough in your job, in your life that you need to use Git. Most people are really cool with these basics. Which is good, because this is 90% of what you do with Git, are these things, and that's it. But then we have to do these other things, and everybody gets really nervous. Oh, thanks. Um, and we start like, what the heck is a detached head state? And we got some blood courage conflicts, and that's where people start getting really nervous, because we get really scared of things we don't understand in life. And that's, even if it's not dangerous, it's, a, it's normal. And Git's a dark art, it really is. Um, it's got terms like plumbing versus porcelain, Git trees and blobs. This is actually the description of rev parse. Pick out and massage parameters. What the heck does that even mean? Feels like it was written by some kind of Linux nerd out there, because it was. Uh, it was written by <laughs> these two guys. You probably don't really understand a lot of how it works. Gitster still maintains it today. That's Junio. Uh, he took over the project five months after it was invented by Linus, who said originally in the original email to the list, hey, I have an idea of how to manage, pa uh, manage um, patches better. I don't think this is ever going to become a full source control management system. Literally in the first email. Uh, the good news here is that you can go and figure out how this works because it's open source. We have all the four freedoms. It's literally one of the coolest open source projects besides the Drupal I can name. Bad news is it's mostly C. And C is really hard to parse and read. Uh, not a bad idea if you already know it, but one of the other things that makes it hard not just that it's C is that there's some concepts that keep getting explained one way because it's easy to explain them that way, but that's not how Git actually works. That's not how it actually actually works. Like branching, we'll get to that later. When I first learned Git, I learned it was a way to manage code. And then I learned, no, it's a way to manage files. It's a way to manage projects. No, no, it's a way to manage file system uh, and track your file system over time. It's not a project thing. It's a, hey, what are in these directories and subdirectories? What's happening in them? When did a thing happen and what caused them to happen? Or who caused them to happen? These are the things we write down with commits. You could build Git uh, yourself, some variation of Git with just these three components. A way to compress your file system at a point in time. A way with the universal tracking system. We have a universal tracking system. We have since the 70s. Anybody know what it is? Any hazards to guess? I can tell you we're at one, we're approximately one, uh, 1,653,000,000, and I forget the rest, but that's where we are right now. What? Uh, UTC is the, the time zone. Very close, though. I'll give it away. Uh, Unix time. We've been counting up since uh, January 1st, 
1970, and every computer on Earth, every device you've ever had, is maintaining the time codes down to the microsecond using that as the universal clock. Um, and we need a way to write those things down. You could use a legal pad, but that's going to get really confusing really quick. Uh, one of the other confusing things in Git is that everything's local. Everything. Um, that is Oakland, California at the bottom. I used to live about five blocks from there. Uh, Gertrude Stein once said, "There's no. The problem with Oakland is there's no here. Or there, the problem with Oakland is there's no there there." Cute. So in the 70s, some artists made a there and a here. So there's definitely a here and a there in Oakland now. Um, from I like this picture because no matter where you are, you're here to you. Even if you're standing, if you're standing by here, you're obviously here, looking at there. But if you're standing there, then you're here to you, looking at here over there, which is there gets the exact same concept. There's no main place for Git. That's a human construct. Everything's local to Git. So whatever you're doing, the concepts of Git only apply to that local and going from it or pulling toward it. And all the concepts kind of start lining up if you start always stepping back and saying, what's the point of reference of Git? And actually, Git will tell you what the point of reference is very clearly. You just got to know what to look for. So let's take a look, quick look at Git internals, and to be specific, we're not looking at the program Git that lives on your computer that makes all of this magic happen. We are looking at the project folder Git. But where those two intersect, and where you intersect those two, other than installing Git, is the second thing you probably ever did was Git config. Everyone saw this when they first installed Git, because the first two lines have to be there for you to collaborate. You have to write down who you are and how to get a hold of you. That's the nature of the project, because this comes, again, from Linus managing patches on a mailing list. That's why the email address has to be there. It's legacy of that. Eventually we'll figure out another unique identifier that's easily uh, transportable. And if you're not doing that last one yet, please do that last one. Start calling all of your initial branches main. It makes that life a lot better for everybody and it's way clearer in the long run. And that's what that becomes. It's a .config folder that lives here for Git for you meaning it lives in your home directory by default. It's not the only place Git pulls config from. It's not the first place Git pulls config from. Then when we look back at this, uh, we see global on all three of those. Global means put it in the home folder for the user. The first place it looks for any config is your system level, and it's there. It might not have anything in it, but it's different on every system. And for my system, I'll show you in a second, um, it only does one thing. And then it's all of my things in git config. And then locally in the .git, conf, uh, .git folder, there is a config file. That overwrites the things above it. The last two, I didn't even know were there before I started writing this talk a while ago, but you can define config per work tree and per blob. You can get down to like literally the blob level of config. I don't know a use case for that off the top of my head. Linus does, but that's why it's in there. You can see all of this very easily with these commands. The last one's the only one that I really care about, um, list show origin. Uh, I did, yeah, that's the wrong header. I'm not gonna fix it right now, but let's pretend I didn't, I wrote the right one, the list show origin there. That's what list show origin does. It shows you where your config lives in each line of config. So that top one is uh, my file, user local, et cetera, you get config. Um, credentials helper OS keychain because I'm on a Mac. That's where it's helping me with that SSH. Uh, there's my git config living on my um, personal. And down at the bottom, I guess I cut, cut it off. Bad picture. I just made this slide right before this talk. So um, it would show me if it was in the local git slash, uh, dot git folder slash config. And that's going to overwrite anything above it. Quick use case of that, if you are working multiple profiles, and you need to have a different signature per repo, just go throw that different signature in the .git slash config file, and it will overwrite your profile at global. You can do that at the blob level, too. So if you need a single blob to be written by someone else, it will let you do it. I just got through the blob flag. Um, OK, but now that we've interacted with it, the system, let's talk about the .git folder itself. If you've never actually pulled it open and started looking around and poking around because you're scared of it, Clone down something that you can safely say, I'm not going to blow this up. This isn't production code. I'm great with this. And then just start poking around with it, because you can't break it at that point. Um, who's ever actually 
under, like looked in like, I'm gonna start investigating what these files do. Anybody? Yeah, good, 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 a couple people. Um, so head, one of the most important pointers in all of Git because it tells you exactly where you are. If you open it, you can play along at home. Um, if you open up um, head and look at that file, it's that long. Sometimes it's a little bit longer because the name of your branch is a little longer, but it just says reference of where I am pointing where here is for me is the reference ref head main. That's where we get to pack refs. Pack ref file tells you where all the heads point. Those are just commits. Again, get just compress the file system, hashed against it, wrote a commit law or um, a commit hash that we can reference and gave a human readable name to it at some point. And the tip of that graph is, well, that's what we call our branches and that's where these things are pointing at the end of that commit. And I'll make more sense later. Because references to what? Yes. Git, and this is where I had to step back and reread the Git book to like start grasping this. Git is taking this full snapshot of the file system every time. We're not storing diffs. We're storing a snapshot. If the file did not change, so between version 2 and version 3 on the slide, A1 is the same file. So Git doesn't make a whole new snapshot of A1. It just points back to the last commit and says, yeah, it's there. But C1 changed to C2. It's a new snapshot of C2. C1 still lives in that compression of version 2, but now we have C2 living in that compression of version 3. Very efficient, though, because B and A1 didn't change, so at this point back to the previous one, all the way back to the beginning of time. Very efficient at that. So what's inside that compression? These are all directly from Get SEM. Uh, Get-SEM.com. Um, we have our commit, the thing we're used to saying, with our tree that it's pointing to. Well, there's a commit up at the top that tells us the commit ID, how big it is, uh, where the tree it's attached to, our tree that we're committing, who authored it. The tree level tells us what blobs we're pointing to, and the blobs are the actual compressed things that we're referring to from the database. So working back the other way around, you change a file, you're making a new blob that gets a new commit hash, that gets added to the work tree that you commit, and that works all the way down. There's a new thing in Git, I'll just mention it, I'm not gonna talk about it deeply, but called partial clones, um, or sparse index, where you can do clones of repos that only contain the commit. They don't actually pull down the tree of the blob, so they're just the list of what is there, not the whole thing. Super lightweight way to do it if you just need access to it, and at some point you will fetch it all. Um, but it's, if you're installing things across thousands of systems, that's why GitHub is pushing for it so hard. Um, so Git's not tracking diffs. It uses diffs, we read diffs, but diff came from the fact that diff is a bash command. That, hey, here's two things, what's the diff? You can just run diff and it will tell you. Git diff is, does that specifically for the files in the index you're tracking. But again, it's not tracking the diff, it's showing you the diff. That's a human concept. It's storing the complete compressed version every time. Index, I mentioned it earlier. Index is a special file that tracks the tree that those blobs are attached to. That's your staging area. So when you git add, it adds it to index. What that actually looks like is this. Uh, this is the closest VS Code can show me what index is because these are compressed, algorithmically compressed things. The only human readable pieces here are the file names. We can get those still, but the actual thing gets like, oh, that's gibberish. I can't tell you what that means. Uh, VS Code couldn't. Those things are called blobs, binary large objects. By the reference, because we hash them and we get a 40 character hash back. I'll just say it out loud, caveat. SHA-1 is how we got to 40. We're at SHA-256 right now, but for a lot of reasons, we're sticking with 40 as the number of characters. Again, not gonna get into that, just that's a caveat in case you're wondering what SHA they're using. Um, so what is in those commits? So here's an actual commit, my object, my binary, binary large objects, oop, reference, and I'm sorry this is as small as it is, but uh, you see down here in my commit, here, 
Uh, my commit ID is 39C85, it doesn't matter after that. In my objects folder, there is folder 39 with one thing in it, C385. That's what it's pointing at, literally. You wanna check that out, cool. That's what it actually puts back in the file system. That's the magic of like, hey, now we've swapped back out. It's like, all right, well, I know what that is. Here's what it looked like. It's so fast, it looks like magic. It's just instantaneous to you and I. When we think of how commits are stacked, this is the picture that Git kind of has in its head, again, always pointing back to a parent. But we don't need to necessarily have a straight line here. You can have multiple parents. That's why we have flags of like first parent or not first parent now. Um, because we only care about one line at a time when we're thinking about authorships and Git lets us track multiple lines of authorship. And if you commit like three things together at once, a three-way diff or a three-way merge, like what's the true parent the answers all of them. I think it's a little bit easier uh, to think about when we think of Git log, not so much as the chain of logs that Git Get cracking client makes it look very pretty, pretty using um, Guitar Hero theming, basically is what we do. Um, kind of getting ahead of myself a little bit. Sorry, I got this slightly over. I was just rearranging it, trying to make optimal use, and I realized I'm just confusing myself. Um, yes, so we want to look back at time at this string of events, which I'll make another point about later. Um, we can go and run a Git log, and Git log, the magic of that is there's this file called or this folder called logs. And git log just gives you a much cleaner way to get to this. And if those of you who are astute in the audience might notice like, we have a starting ref and an ending ref, and then the name of the person who did it, and the Unix timestamp, and the UTC offset, like where they were in the world when they wrote it, or where the computer thought they were, um, and check out moving from uh, like w whatever the git action was performed. And the astute observer might say, wait a minute, that's the same beginning and ending hash. Because Git's not actually just tracking commits. Git log just tells you commits because it's a nice thing to have, because that's the way Linus wanted it, because that's the shortcut he was thinking of when he created the thing. Git actually tracks every single thing that happens for a minimum of 30 days. It tracks some things up to 90 days by default. You can set this, this is configurable. I mentioned config earlier. That's actually the page where a lot of people get like bogged down when they try to learn Git from the manual, because Literally, the second section of the Git manual is 38,500 and some words long. It's a ridiculous document. It's a two-day read all on its own, and it's dense as hell. And most of it's not useful for most people. Um, Reflog really is, because uh, you can sit, reset like how long things sit around before they get repackaged. And 30 days by default is where it sits out there before it's packaged down to gets compressed down even further into a package list for efficiency's sake, because you can always run a ref log. Git ref log, super powerful command that lets you get access to everything that's happened in recent memory. But you can also access it by just going and looking at the logs, and it will show you the same information, just compressed down in a neat way. The really cool thing about git ref log is all of these head at numbers and curly braces, you can check those out. So if you deleted a branch and like, oh no, I am hose, git checkout, head, curly brace two, you're right back to where you were and you can make a new branch off of that and you're right back to good or copy paste or do whatever you want. It's not quite a restore, um, it's a way to get back at history. Um, but it's not limited just the way um, rebase or reset by default work against the commits. You can check out anything. But those commands are like, well, you mean to get back to the other commit, right? You can override that, there's flags. We're not gonna get into like, the crazy amount of flags it takes to do that. Just know you can get to here anytime you want. If you have never run a git ref log, it's fun. Uh, but that also puts us in, ah, dang it, I did push it way too close to the edge. Um, <laughs> you can check out any state, but it puts you in this thing called detached head state. Does anyone know what detached head simply means? It's where you're not on the branch that you thought you were supposed to be and you're still floating. You're still on the branch because you're in that line of commits always, but you're not the head anymore. That's, that's, that's very close, but that's awesome. For the sake of time, I'm just going to pal-pal through that. But that's, thank you, that's really good because 
it's a superpower. You know, you aren't just at the t tips of the branches. You can be anywhere in the entire history and do things from that. That's something other version control systems have always struggled with, and why it's a super, real superpower in Git. Question? Yeah, I had a quick question. Is, it, is there ever a situation where being at the detached head is good? Because usually I do it on accident. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, it is, uh, it's a superpower. You can just go back and look at what's there. You can walk around. It even says that in the, um, like, look, look around. You can change things, uh, but it'll be discarded when you check things back out. Or you can make a new branch off of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this usually happens if you do git checkout and then some past commit ID. Yeah. Yeah. Any any commit ID. Actually, this is one of those fun, confusing things about Git. Mm -hmm. Is any commit ish. That's what the docs say. Commit dash ish. A commit ish is anything that leads you to a commit. That can be a tag, that can be a branch name, that can be a pointer, that can be uh, about 10 other specific things in Git that I don't, can't remember off the top of my head. Uh, or it could be the commit ID. And it could be seven letters of the commit ID, it could be 40 characters of the commit ID. Mm -hmm. Actually, Git doesn't care after as soon as it's unique. It can be as minimum, I think, a six. Mm -hmm. But as soon as it's unique, Git's like, I know what you're talking about. But uh, by default, everybody kind of says seven or eight in their docs. Um, so what are branches? If we're looking at these checked out things from branches, most people see this beautiful picture made by the people that wrote Gitflow, the original Gitflow doc um, and, and blog. It's beautiful, but man, it's confusing. What's more confusing though, is how Git kind of actually thinks of this, is a laundry list of commit IDs and you and readable pointers that are literally saying, this is where we're at right now. So to get, it's just a giant spreadsheet. It's that legal pad. That's why I used a legal pad earlier. And we're already notes of like, here's where head is, but head, it's also pointing to hotfix. But head could also point to right here, which isn't at the tip of any of those branches. But we could make a new branch from that if we wanted. It's just a laundry list we're making notes on the side of human readable notes. It should be easier than that, but this is the more close, but this also gets really confusing because we're really bad at looking at lists and doing things with it. Graphically, it looks like this. It's a lot prettier, but wow, when you're first learning, it's like, I think it would be more useful to learn this first. At least I do. Because it makes the next concepts a little bit cleaner, in my opinion. Merge preserves your set of refs along the line. Rebase literally rewrites them replaying them. So when you run a rebase, one of the first things it says is rewinding. I think that's actually the first thing it spits out. Conceptually, again, pictures are awesome. Makes it look like this. That a merge, I'm not going to really get into merge because everybody kind of, I think, grocks that. It's like, yeah, we set this other set of commits now and now we're going to pull those com changes and the changes from the main branch in together, and forgive me for not updating this to main, I pulled this literally out of the Git book, which hasn't been updated since 2016. Uh, but it pulls those two together and says, here's a new commit called C5, we're good to go. Rebase says, all right, we're going uh, to take this other branch, rewind history to where you branched it off from, and then rewrite all of the commits that have happened including the ones that were on that branch already and make a brand new commit called whatever your old branch was called. In this case, C4 prime. Hey, let's rewind history to the point where this originally branched from, we file this list down, we'll get to, well, I did that wrong. Uh, but we'll get this down to like here. Let's rewind history and then rewrite those, what, what, the blobs that were in that commit. Let's rewrite those blobs against that tree and make a whole new history. So that branch still technically has a pointer to it, but it's the same pointer as the thing you overwrote. Again, I can't teach you, and I don't expect anyone to have a full like, oh, that's how it works. But hopefully that's enough new information. To be like, oh, I will go play with rebase a little more. Again, right out of the get book, do not rebase commits that exist outside your repo. Once you've pushed it and someone else can access it, do not rebase. Have a conversation with someone if they really want to rebase and explain why it's a bad idea to them. But uh, locally, there's a superpower to rebase called Squash. 
How many people have made 15 edits or 15 commits because of typos in a row? Oh yeah, my Git histories are atrocious. But there's this magical ability to squash it down so it's one thing. And I'm like, oh, there's, that, that's magically what I did in one commit. And I pushed that and everybody's happy. But that literally, this line is, I did not make this up. Follow that guideline, you'll be fine. If you don't, people will hate you and you will be scorned by friends and family. That's the truth. Um, if you rebase a single commit, that's just called cherry picking. I say with an asterisk because you can cherry pick however many you want. How many people have ever committed to the wrong branch? Yep. This is just cherry pick it over there and you're good to go. Again, it's not some magical graph you're rewriting. You are literally changing where pointers are in a spreadsheet to get, and it doesn't care. But eventually you will run into merge conflicts. It's inevitable. Uh, I'm hoping that people already know this one, but I would like to include it. Uh, I encourage you to go and fix your merge conflicts by hand at least if, a few times. Because Git is pretty dang good at this. It'll say, hey, I failed. And then you just go look at the commits or the files that didn't get added to staging. Just run a Git status and say, all right, these ones didn't get picked up. Go look at them and they'll do exactly this. This is where head was pointing and it said this. And the branch that you wanted to merge or rebase said this. I don't know what to do. Remember, get it, if you type man get into a terminal, the first thing it says is get is the stupid content tracker. Mm. Literally what the inventors called it. Because it, as soon as it gets confused, you just, I don't know, and it waits. So all you have to do to fix this, anybody guess what, what you do to fix this? Let's say, let's say uh, what was in head was the correct one. You can delete everything else. And then what? And then save the file. And then what? Save the file. And then what? And then commit that. Oh, you got to add it. But yeah, you're on the right track. Yeah, once you change the file manually, then it's right back to your normal workflow. I know what to do now. Git add, git commit. Hooray, we're done. Um, and because you did it in the middle of a merge, anything that would have been merged already got added to index, to that staging area. So you just got to fix the merge conflicts, manually add those in, and now you have an index that's ready to commit, and you're back to good. On to power tools. This is the end of the talk and a few things that I just think everybody should know if you don't already know these. Um, Git bisect is super powerful. It uses the power of math to get it to any commit where you're looking for a single line of code or anything, really. Git bisect has a lot of commands, but the only four you really care about are start, good, bad, and reset. Let's say someone notices there's a bug here. You're like, well, that bug was in the last four commits. Uh, I, we, we know it wasn't in the previous tag, release tag. So it was somewhere between that release tag and where we're at today, which could be hundreds, maybe thousands of commits. Where did that line get introduced? Who did this? Well, in a perfect world, there would be commit messages that explain exactly that in detail. In the real world, um, you can run a git bisect, st bisect start, and it says, okay, I'm set, I'm ready to go now. Tell it, you know it's in a bad state, so since you're already checked out head, uh, and that's where you live, that's where here is, you just say git bisect bad, it's like, okay, this is bad. Uh, and then you go find where it's good, again, the last release tag, it's like, git bisect good. And it's like, okay, I can cut that distance in half. The middle commit is then checked out. Go look at the code. And then it waits for you to say, get bisect good, get bisect bad. If it's not there, it's good. If it's there, it's bad. Cut it in half. Now we have a new good and bad spot. Uh, the maximum steps you could possibly have with this, I think it's 12 theoretically, um, but in most cases it's less than seven. It's the uh, 11 folds of a paper. Uh, so it's 11 is the max, but uh, most of the time you're gonna find it under seven. Superpower. Again, can't teach to see it. They actually just improved Git Bisect in um, 2.37, which is the newest version of Git came out June 22nd. So if you haven't updated Git in a while, please update Git. Uh, a few reasons for that, but the two coolest are Git Bisect now is verbose. It will actually tell you what's running before it just like Git Bisect start and it just sat there and you had no idea. Um, uh, and the other thing is Git-V now shows you Git version like every other tool on earth. Literally, you had to type out version every time you wanted to see your Git version. Uh, Git allows you to have 
multiple branches checked out at once. Blew my mind the first time I saw this in action. Git, because it is tracking the file system, is only paying attention to the file that the .git folder is in and everything below it. Since 2015, literally since 2015, I forget what version, I think 1.38 or something like that. Um, but anyway, ever since then, we've been able to say, all right, Git, I want the main branch to live in this other folder on my file system. And I want this feature to live on this other file on my folder system. And I want this file, this branch, to live in this other folder on my file system. And it'll make um, a linked copy, a significantly linked copy of that branch over there. So when you want to check out that other branch, you just change directory. And Git's like fine with that. Like it has now multiple branches open at the same time. They just don't live in the same file on your file system. They live separate files. So ideally, as I showed in the picture here, I made this picture, um, you would uh, throw somewhere else. So in this case, we're just like, okay, go up a logical level, then put main beside the repository, and feature one beside the repository, and feature two beside the repository. We're outside of the repository, it's not recursively below it, it's not gonna get confused. And this is how it works. So get work tree list, it'll show you everything in your work tree. There's always at least one thing, because it's always tracking one thing, because it's always here, head's pointing somewhere. If you go into head and delete it, I don't actually know what happens. I've never actually done that, because that scares me. Because um, then you can <laughs> tell Git it's nowhere, and I don't know what would happen. Um, Git work tree list will point, tell you exactly what's checked out and where it lives. Git work tree add, and then you say the path and the branch, it will just check that out for you, like make that available. Um, that is my last slide. Uh, one of the reasons I like, and this is not a sales pitch at all for Git lens, is, and there was, this is why I know about it, is there's this thing where I can, I don't want to do that, I want to, not search, I want more work tree, work tree plus. I'm already signed in, what are you talking about? Give me just a second. All right, so it will let you, will it do it now? All right, live demos, right, everybody? Um, it's a GUI interface for, for that feature, is what I was looking for. Um, you can hit a button and it will walk you through the steps of setting it up and then you have, instead of running work tree list, it will just show you the work trees checked out. Caveat with that is, even though you have multiple work trees checked out, remember where your ID or your uh, code editor is pointing. It won't magically change where VS Code is pointing. You still need to go deal with that. But VS Code is still pointing at the main repo. If you go check out in the, and that's what I was gonna demo, if you check out, if I check out the repo, or I check out another directory in my terminal, these code explorer is still pointing at the original file, not the other directory. So if I change something here, it's only gonna be affected in that branch checked out in this repo, or in this folder, not the other branch. Sorry, that's a little confusing. Again, use this and it'll become immediately clear the first time you do it. Um, but that's kind of the end of my talk. And I guess I went a little faster than I thought I could have, or thought I should have. Um, but uh, dig, in your, dig into uh, Git internals. You can't break Git. You can break an individual Git folder, absolutely. But again, clone down something and just start playing around because then what you're gonna do is blow it out and clone it down again. Oh, dang. I did put this out of work because I wanted to mention Git hooks at the end and I just put this in here like an hour ago. Um, the last thing, okay, this is the last thing. Git hooks. Who here uses Git hooks? Okay, Git hooks are this. You can build any contraption you can think of. You build a script, Git hits a trigger, it does the thing. That's a Rube Goldberg. I actually wrote the full alt text in the speaker notes. Yay. I kind of want to show them off now. Because um, this is the actual... Uh, yeah, that's the actual, um, wow, well, that's a really weird error, yeah, a bug. Uh, uh, yeah, the Professor Butts of uh, the self-operating napkin, soup spoon A is raised to the mouth, pulling string B, and thereby jerking ladle C, which allows cracker D, pass, launches cracker D, pass toucan E, toucan jumps after cracker, 
and perches, tilts, upsetting seeds into the pail. Extra weight in the pail pulls the cord, opens, ignites lighter. Uh, ice lighter setting off skyrocket, which causes sickle to cut string, allowing pendulum with attached napkin to swing back and forth, thereby wiping chin. If that doesn't explain the hook system in Drupal, I don't know what does. Uh, this is a Drupal account. A Drupal account. Um, so go back to slides. Okay, but in all seriousness, there are 17 hooks. Uh, Githooks.com, Matthew Hudson, tremendous community contributor who has made this wonderful set of resources for everyone in the world. Go read it. I'm not going to read all of these to you, um, but the ones I always care about are these three. Commit message, prepare commit message, and pre-commit. Before I make a commit, I can run checks. Did I do this wrong? Did I accidentally include a secret? Um, AWS Labs has a, a free and open source project called um, Get Secrets, and it will stop you from committing secrets. And so then people have forked that and made it work for Google Cloud, Azure, literally any platform out there, and you can assign it like what passwords, and it will stop you from accidentally adding something. It's pretty, pretty powerful. Um, but if you can script it, you can make Git automated. And you go to that site, there are tons of examples like how to deploy a website. Somebody wrote a website in like 2010. How do you use Git hooks to deploy your website? Like in 2010, like this is predates most DevOps. Like this is predates GitLab by years. And this has just been in, it's just been in there since the beginning. You have superpowers. All right. If you want to get to be a Git pro and know more than I do, because I only know so much, uh, the Git book. Again, it hasn't been updated since 2016, maybe 2014, no, 2014. Um, since 2014, we have seen a lot of stuff added and a lot of stuff changed, but the basics are all here. Um, and it's free. It's really dense, but it's well written. And if you ever get stuck, there's dang it git. That's the PG version of the site. There's also oh shit git, which is the exact same website, just all the curse words, well, dang it git has the curse words removed. Um, and you get to the bottom of it, and it's like all the tips to get out of bad situations, like how to get out of the middle of a rebase that's gone bad. Like it's all like those steps of how to get out of it. But this is how it ends. Like at the end of it, forget this noise. I give up. Remove, pseudo remove, sue don't. Never sudo. Um, but remove the folder, clone it back down, and start over. Git's gonna be there, it's gonna keep working. Can't really blow it up. Uh, but that's me. If you have any questions, feel free to hit me up on email, Twitter, or anything else. But we got about five minutes left. I'm happy to go back and talk about anything because I know I went really, really, really fast. And there's a lot here. Yeah. yeah what do you think about GUIs like um, Tortoise Git and Source Street? I personally work for a company that makes a GUI, so I have very strong opinions that Git Kraken is the best because mm -hmm. um, it's on my shirt, literally. Um, I think, I think because Git conceptually is a graphical thing. Any GUI, if used for the purposes of understanding what's going on, is a good idea. Uh, if you are relying on it instead of learning the concepts, like I know I smash this button, it does a thing, I know I smash that button, it does a thing, but I don't know what it does, then no matter what tool you're using, that's bad. Now it's a black box and you have no idea what's inside. The more you get to how does it do this, what what is it invoking? Like Am I making a new branch by right mouse clicking? What does that actually mean? And if you know fully, like, oh, I could just do that from the command line, but it's way easier to right mouse click and do it this way, then GUIs are great. They're time savers. I use the GUI when I, like, 90% of the time I make a commit. Sometimes I do it if I'm just doing something local and just, what's he, or I'm testing something and I need to do a bunch of commits, so I'll just do it programmatically. But anyway, um, I think they're great learning tools. They're great time savers, but they shouldn't be like, I don't know how this works. So that's my general advice on them. Um, one reason, and this is again, not trying to sell you on this, the one reason I like Git Kraken now is because we do have a terminal built in. So I need to do a Git bisect. Um, I actually made a video for that you can find on YouTube, but it's easier for me to do a Git bisect because I don't have to run a Git log to like figure out where I'm at in the stack. I literally can see on the graph what I've checked out and where it falls like, and then to copy the SHA is literally click on the thing on the side where the SHA is showing and it'll automatically copy the clipboard. I don't have to go highlight anything or retype seven characters that I might probably gonna typo. But again, that's one of the reasons I like a GUI. 
but up to everybody. I know some people will never use a GUI, and that's fine. Again, at the end of the day, it's just writing down lists and timestamps. <laughs> yeah, get bisect reset. Yeah. Is that setting the head back, or is it erasing the commits, or what exactly is it doing? Great question. Um, I didn't actually talk about that. I kind of skipped over that last one. Get right reset. Uh, get bisect reset tells get turn off the bisect uh, bisect tool and go back to whatever you were pointing at beforehead. What it's doing when you're saying good and bad, you're in detached head mode and it's just selecting the head you checked out. While you're in there, you can make a new branch off of it. All your other commands will work. But when you say git bisect reset, it's like, all right, you don't want to bisect anymore. Cool, the last place I was pointing was here, so I'll just default head back to wherever I was. So it's not putting your head back in time? What? It's just helping you identify that commit. Yeah, that's all, actually... that's all bisect is doing okay. is checking out a detached head state somewhere along the graph path yeah. uh, in, your, in your commit history. It's just saving you the time of doing it manually. Okay. It's just, and then it's using the idea of like, if I cut, always cut it in half, I'll eventually get it down to like two and like seven steps. I was curious, like if you had made like X number of bad commits, you just wanted to wipe all those away. Mm -hmm. Is the best way to set your head back in time or kill those commits some other way? Ooh, that's a dangerous question. Um, I'm just gonna say it out loud. Get reset dash dash hard commit ID is the fastest way to do that. It's the most dangerous way to do that. It's the way that will make your team the maddest at you. Get revert to step all the way back is the safest way, but it's the messiest way you could possibly do it. Because you can revert individual commits, and as long as you keep track of you're doing it in exactly the order they happened in, revert where they happened in, that's the cleanest, best way that your team will be like, this is really messy, but you didn't blow anything up. Um, the other way is go back to the branch you, or the commit, uh, Detached head that you want to like, all right, this we know is good. Make a new branch called new goodness or something from that state. Then force that onto your main branch. And you're like, all right, I'm going to rewrite everything that happened in there. And I'm going to have those states. But now we have like the state I want on top of it. Those are three ways to get to the same thing. I can't tell you what the right one is. Those all three will do what you want them to do. But how is your team going to deal with that? Like, the Git project itself would reject those outright because, like, there's a way they want to do it with a patching. Again, talk to your team on those. Good question. I was just going to ask if uh, Git Bisect was similar to Quicksort. It kind of sounds like the same kind of base. Like, you cut the thing in half. I guess what I learned was that Quicksort, the algorithm, just reorders different halves and things like that. Um, so this isn't a sorting, it's literally, um, that's why I like this picture, it's a yeah. Zeno's paradox. Uh, so it's not exactly apples to apples. Um, let me just show you on here because I got an example. So let's just say, let's just say that I know this is a bad state I'm, and this is a really trivial example and I know this is a good state and there are, actually let's go back, let's go back. Say I know this was a good state in the main branch and I know this is a bad state. So I can go back through one by one and look for it, but let's say instead of like 10, there are a thousand commits here. It will say, all right, between this one and the thousands, we go look at the 500s. 500's good? Okay, that's split between the 500 and the thousands, and now we're at the 250 mark of that commit. All right, now that we know that that's good, let's go back and cut that in half again. And that's all bisect is really doing. It's just like giving you the advantage of not having to randomly select. It randomly selects the exact halfway point, or not randomly, it selects the halfway point. So you can say quickly, yes or no. And through the power of math, about seven steps. Can, can you explain that diagram? Because I feel like I kind of understood what it was. So this was uh, Zeno's paradox. Um, uh, Achilles can't complete the race because in order to go halfway to the race, all right, in order to go to the end of the race, he has to go half of the point of the race. But to get to the half point of the middle of the race, he has to go half the distance of that. In order to go that distance, he has to go at least half the distance of that. And this continues on to infinity. And since it's infinite numbers of steps, it takes you an infinite amount of time. 
Except that's obviously a paradox because Achilles can run the race and the turtle will lose because Achilles is really fast. Um, but that's kind of the thing. It's like having it every time. So and it, yeah, actually with this picture, so we know, let's just say this is the, the good state, that's the bad state, or no, the good state's on the end, this is the bad state. Like we jumped up, it's like, no, okay, bad's still here, but we're still good up there. Bad's still here, good up there, bad's still good. No, no, okay, now this was the commit we're actually we're looking for. But using that power of having to get there. So I guess it was a good picture after all. Yeah. This binary search, right? What? This binary search. Yeah, binary search. Oh, that's, yeah, yeah. That's what, yeah. thank you, Bo. Cutting the right half all the time. Yep, yeah. yep. Bo, Bo hit her on the head. Thanks, Bo. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why the power of community, hey, y'all. Mm -hmm. Um, but I am over time, so I'm going to say thank you very much for your time. This little talk will be online. You can get these slides again. If I jump all the way back to the beginning, uh, tinyurl-cashville, and I'm always happy to talk about this stuff whenever. So hit me up.